Welcome back to another episode of Wahapa, the show where we take a stroll through the halls of shame, the corridors of catastrophe, and the basement of bumbles. In the games industry, sometimes things hop on, which results in publishers releasing games broken, unfinished, or just plain bad, and a few games exemplify this better than our subject today, Dai Katana. Do you want a story featuring clashing egos, expensive cars, backdoor dealings, firings, hirings, and monumental failure? Well, this one's got it all, my friends. Daikatana, or Big Sword in Japanese, is one of the coolest monikers for a video game ever, and that name alone is one of the few that elicits an immediate and visceral reaction. It ranges from, oh god, shut up, Daikatana's the worst, to, what's, what's Daikatana? And especially, get out of my bathroom, Matt! Well, for the uninitiated, it was a first-person shooter released in 2000 on the PC with ports on the Nintendo 64 and... The Game Boy Color? Is that right? Game... Boy, color, okay. And directed, produced, and designed by one John Romero. Who is John Romero? Well, he's a motherfucking rock star! Now, to make sure to set the scene here, we need to go back to the beginning of this man's career. One that was filled with dizzying heights, terrifying lows, and creamy middles. The early 90s were a fascinating time for the game industry, where developers, especially indie ones, started realizing they could make a lot of money a lot of fast, if they were shrewd enough and had the right tech. And Romero had both. He started out working for the company Softdisk, along with super nerd John Carmack and a few other talented young designers. But Romero was always thinking of the side hustle. Is your fledgling company stuck making boring games for some bland publisher? Well then, use their computers when they're not looking to develop Commander Keen for another company. Carmack's programming wizardry and making capable engines afforded the other members of the team to design their games to move faster and smoother than anything seen on the PC up to that point. They christened themselves id Software and made a few other um, things you might have heard of Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, Doom 2, Quake, the, the list is well known. Aside from these games selling well and being critically praised, they were also simultaneously revolutionizing the PC space as well. With that kind of success comes a bit of ego, or maybe a lot of ego, and money of course. And like we already hinted, Romero had been full of the former and very quickly gained the latter. However, it became apparent that both Johns had different philosophies on how to handle all this newfound success. Carmack was inconspicuous and preferred to be programming away in his spare time, while Romero was a more out there personality, doing interviews, posing like a dork for magazines, and of course, indulge in a game developer's favorite pastime when they've hit it big, buying expensive cars. A rift was always kind of there between the two, and around the completion of Quake, which was Romero's first time in the directing chair, things came to a head. The development of Quake, despite winding up as a classic upon completion, was still fraught with a lot of speed bumps. Romero was accused by his bosses at id for not being 100% focused on the project and apparently led his team around in circles for months. While this may be conjecture, it was true that Romero did have his time split in other directions as he was helping Raven Software with Hexen in addition to directing Quake. Within the corporate structure of id, however, Romero felt his desire to push game design was secondary to just shipping it, and was frustrated that while he wanted to come up with new features and really make Quake all that it could be, he was being pressured to simply finish it. He was unhappy during the last few months of the development period, so he started the groundwork of setting up his own company, and even invited former id designer Tom Hall to go all in with him. While exact details are sketchy here, it seems somehow Romero's bosses at id maybe found out about all this, so they just fired him. Oh, well, that simplifies matters then. With no longer any commitment to id, Romero was free to start up his new venture with a name only Rockstar developers could come up with, Ion Storm. Now, right here, let's, let's play a game of pretend. Total fantasy. Let's say you're a famous rich person in the late 90s. 
You then quickly decide to spend millions and millions of dollars on your new startup company, right? Remember, you helped make fucking doom. You buy a 22,000 square foot studio, put in fucking koi ponds in your lobby, and hire coke snorting robot maids. Then at a press conference, you tilt down your sunglasses and say, listen up, our first game's gonna be Die Katana. Drop the mic and let the hype create itself. That's a crazy and outlandish scenario, isn't it? Well, that's exactly what Romero did when he announced his new project. Except for maybe the koi ponds and robots? That, that might be true. Daikatana was indeed announced in early 1997 with a promise that it would see a late Christmas release that year, or early 1998 if things go really bad. Now, if you were paying attention earlier, you'll remember that Big Sword eventually released in mid-2000. Yeah, think things went really bad. So what happened? Oh, so many things. The first major one is that it's pretty fucking ambitious to start a brand new company in the early stages of fully 3D games, announce that your game exists, and then say it'll be out by the end of the year. Like, if there's any time things can go wrong and go wrong bad, it's when everyone is still kind of grappling with 3D engines, especially when you no longer have your turbo nerd programming gremlin to help you out of a jam. Romero didn't want to be beholden by technology like he felt he had been at id, with so much emphasis being placed on the engine, and instead felt it better to license out pre-existing ones and then focus on the design. With that in mind, he made another really ballsy move, license the Quake engine from id, one that he obviously knew pretty well, and work off that. Things were progressing fairly well initially, but after months of development, Romero and the rest of Ion Storm realized that new tech wasn't just coming out of id software anymore, and other developers were playing catch up. Now, gameplay wise, Quake wasn't doing anything drastically new, but its 3D engine certainly did. It was fast and responsive, and everyone else wanted their games to run like that. There was even a developer out there making something called Unreal? Eh, regardless, it became clear that Quake's engine was fast becoming antiquated and Daikatana needed to impress literally everyone in the world for it to make the impact Romero wanted. Hard to do that on an engine that was already being outclassed by newer ones. They needed something cutting edge and they needed it now. Which did Romero choose? Id Tech. Two, of course. His former employer put out the sequel to Quake very fast. In fact, it released right when Dai Katana was supposed to come out in December of 1997. It's pretty wild that id Software, a company Romero felt over time was stifling him creatively, were still the ones that were inadvertently pushing him in certain directions. Still though, the feeling was that with Ion Storm's experience working with the original Quake tech, it would make for an easy transition to its successor, right? Big no! The two engines couldn't have been more different, as id Tech 2 was a massive jump forward. Everything would need to be redone, recoded, and worst of all, nothing could be reused. They scrapped everything they had worked on up until that point. This was a massive gamble, as Daikatana was already going to miss its original target release date of 1997, and they'd basically be back to the drawing board if they used id Tech 2. Even if everything went perfectly, the best estimate would be maybe late 1998 for the game to come out. John Romero wanted to have the best looking game he could, so the dice was rolled. One of the main tenets he wanted the game to adhere to is the quake he always wanted to make, without the restrictions and timelines of bureaucrats holding him back. He was going to make a first person shooter, yes, but he would design something id seemingly had no interest in at the time, something different. Now is a good time as any to talk about what Daikatan, or sorry, Big Sword actually is. One thing you can certainly say for the game is that it has no shortage of new ideas, scope, and innovation. Taking place in the near future of 2455, our main hero, uh, Hiro Miyamoto. Pardon the interruption, Miyamoto-san. 
is visited by a gross old man who starts banging on about how cool the fucking Dai Katana is and really trying to get the weapon over. He tells of warring Japanese clans fighting throughout the generations to attain this magic sword, ancient betrayals and descendants and time travel and shit for a first person shooter in the late 90s or early 2000s in this case, it's an impressively fleshed out story. Not only that, all this narrative comes fully voice acted with in-game cinematics and definitely has its own palatable sense of style, quite the opposite of id software games at the time. This rings true since John Carmack famously once said, story in a game is like story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not important. Which is a pretty profound quote, if you think about it. I mean, look, if there's one guy that's watched thousands of millions of hours of porn, it's Carmack. Jokes aside, while that sentiment seems pretty harsh and narrow-minded on its own, it's actually way more harsh in context. In the fantastic book, Masters of Doom, it was revealed that Carmack said it directly to Tom Hall in a conversation. The same Tom Hall who happened to be working on Doom's narrative elements at the time. Mr. Hall quit id soon after. Ah, classic, robotic, unfeeling Carmack. Back to Big Sword. Not only was the story a much more involved affair, it wasn't just fluff to simply set things up. I mentioned time travel earlier, and that's woven into the game pretty prominently. You visit four different time periods across 24 different levels, and the story takes various twists and turns along the way, mostly involving the allegiances and well-being of your teammates. Yes, Dai Katana's big defining feature, AI controlled bots that fought alongside you. This was mostly unheard of at the time. Two intelligent NPCs that followed and backed up the player for the entire game? That would also help you solve puzzles, and if they died in a level, it would also result in a game over? What could go wrong with that? Everything. If the AI wasn't great, which it wasn't, for being one of Dai Katana's main gameplay hooks, it was a disaster for Ion Storm to not nail this aspect of the design. Your buddies would often be the cause of unavoidable game overs, would get stuck on level geometry, and a bevy of other issues. While this was a definite problem, it only compounded things because of the rest of the game couldn't really make up for it. The graphics were still outdated in 2000, ho-hum shooting mechanics, and lots more bugs and glitches hampered the game overall. When it comes down to it though, it all boils down to hype being one of the most negative factors that impacted Big Sword. The game had been delayed so many times, making so many E3 appearances with each one being less and less impressive as time went on, it really did seem like Romero's ambition was outpacing the need to actually ship the game. Sure, there were legit technological reasons for a lot of those delays, with the engine switch taking months and months of additional dev time, but looking back on it now, it seems like the smarter choice would have been what Romero hated the most, stripping out features and cutting content to make sure the game ships. So all these delays just, just made it worse. Oh man, when this thing finally comes out, it's gonna blow our fucking minds though! But it wasn't going to. It was a pretty standard FPS with some ambition in the storytelling and some neat features, but it was never designed to be much more than that. It just took too long to come out. Now, up until this point, we've been exclusively talking about the PC version. Yes, as strange as it seems, an N64 port also came out day and day with Ion Storm's version, and even stranger still, it was a port handled by Japanese publisher Kemco. This version is weird and feels like a slower paced fan mod than anything else. As expected, it also has dramatically scaled back cutscenes with no voiceovers, missing levels, horrible looping music for each time period, and something I only found out during the making of this video was a blockbuster exclusive rental for months. Yeah, you couldn't even buy the goddamn thing until Christmas of that year, in which case, you'd be pretty pissed if this was under your tree at that point. Kemco had no faith in the brand anymore, and that's why the aforementioned and incomprehensible Game Boy Color version never saw a release in North America. I mean, why bother? When the main game is bombing as hard as it was, who'd give a hot fuck about playing a Game Boy version of it? 
That being said, this port is a curio in the purest sense of the word, as it's actually a top-down action RPG a bit akin to Zelda. Apparently, Romero requested the game to be designed this way as he felt it would be a better fit for the handheld. It even reviewed pretty well. Huh. <laughs> At least that's kind of neat. So, now is the point in the video where we basically point to the WrestleMania sign for an awkward amount of time. There. There it is. Soak it all in. While a lot of blame can be laid at Romero's feet for the actual development of Daikatana, this is not one of those things. A marketing sleazeball, let's call him Paul, was hired to generate more hype for the game, and he pitched this infamous advert to Romero by saying it would make a lot of waves and be something called edgy. Romero thought at the time it was risky and had some serious doubts, but still gave it the green light nonetheless. Not only was this a classless advertisement, it wasn't really selling or advertising the game, just the idea of it, or more accurately, its director. Since there wasn't really much footage of Daikatana in 1997 and 98, mostly because the game barely existed, this is all they had to work with. And hey, that marketing guy, would you believe, was fired shortly after this advertisement came out. That's. That's just crazy! Romero has given several interviews throughout the years apologizing for the ad and saying it was a mistake, so good on him for owning up to the thing that was bad. Let's let's all move on. Now at this point, Ion Storm had lost a lot of money on Daikatan Big Sword when it failed to sell the billion units it was projected to. But the year 2000 had at least one bright spot. The company had a sister office in Austin, Texas, which produced a little thing called Deus Motherfucking X, or just Deus X for short. Romero and Hall had nothing to do with the title, as it was the brainchild of Warren Spector and Harvey Smith, and of course would win several Game of the Year awards, but unfortunately only sold modestly well and it wasn't enough to save the company. Romero and Hall left in 2001 and their Dallas office was closed down, but the Austin one soldiered on and produced Invisible War and the third game the Thief franchise for IDOS. So at least they went out with some decent titles before finally closing up shop in 2005. Romero would have a very tumultuous and checkered history of the next few years as he joined up with Flophouse favorite Midway Games and became the project lead on Gauntlet 7 Sorrows. Midway's sad attempt to reboot the Gauntlet franchise and get away from all that annoying, fun arcade fantasy roots that everyone loved. The game is almost worthy to get its own episode of Wahapa, but I, I don't want to. The one thing I will expand upon is that development on Gauntlet was so rocky, Romero would leave the team months before the game was even close to being finished, and Midway would remove the characters he created specifically for the title. Damn! Ever since then, Johnny R would bounce around between mobile development, starting up smaller companies, closing them again, and seemingly has retired from active game development, only to now do interviews about the good old days when he was on top of the world. Like I said before though, I honestly feel that Daikatana received overly harsh criticism because expectations were so high as well as people still being pissed about that blindingly red magazine advert. It's not a good game, you know, you know, for sure, but if it had managed to somehow come out at the end of 97, I don't think it would have received the critical drubbing it eventually got almost three years later in mid-2000, where, sadly, it became the entire game industry's bitch until Duke Nukem Forever came along. Hey, if you know of any other gargantuan gaming grenades that exploded in a spectacular explosion of failure, let me know in the comments below or hit me up at mattmcmuscles at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.